In these few moments with a book, I wish to continue the subject of the Christian's warfare which I began in the last broadcast. Last week I sought to project the biblical teaching concerning our enemy, the devil, and his purpose as God of this present age and prince of this world to overthrow God and his universe and to keep men enslaved to him and to their sins. Today, let us consider God's purpose and God's plan to defeat Satan and to bring victory to mankind through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. God's purpose and plan was not an afterthought occasioned by Satan's fall and by man's sin. In fact, before the beginning of the world, God in his foreknowledge of deity foresaw the havoc before it occurred. And in his eternal purpose, he determined the course of victory. It was in these eternal counsels that he determined to carry out retribution to Satan, to bring redemption to fallen man, and to accomplish reconciliation of all things through his beloved Son. In Ephesians 3.11 we read these words, According to the eternal purpose, which he hath purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now I wish, by his grace, to occupy you with him, my dear listening friend. He, the Son of God, is Christ, the seed of the woman. He is Jesus, the Savior of sinners. He is Lord, the Sovereign of heaven and earth. God's plan, you see, is one that includes the conquest of Satan, the redemption of man, and the reconciliation of all things to himself by Jesus Christ. In the Garden of Eden, where Satan seemed to have achieved a victory, actually it was there that he in reality received his defeat. The sin of Adam gave God the opportunity to manifest his grace. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God made a way of salvation for Adam and Eve, and also for all men, that they might escape Satan's power and bondage. It was in the garden after man's sin that God gave the promise of a Savior, the one who would defeat and destroy Satan and nullify his work through the redemption of man. The coming conqueror, would be Christ, the seed of the woman. In Genesis 3, 14, 15, we read, The Lord God said unto the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. The enmity would result in a double bruising, you see. And here we learn what occurred. God's heart indeed is told out in his eternal purpose. The cross upon which the bruised, bleeding Savior was to hang is projected as the place of victory over a fatally bruised Satan. Then the day <clears throat> long promised dawned when the seed royal was born of a virgin. His name was called Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins. In the finished work of this Savior, we find in Ephesians 1 and 2 that Christ was, as a result of this work, made the head of the church, which is his body. And this is composed of every believer, redeemed out of every race, nation, people, and tribe since the day of Pentecost. In this present age, the head in heaven works through his body here on earth, carrying out God's plan of redemption. The task of the church is to preach and teach the gospel of a full and free salvation by grace through faith in Christ. He's the Savior of sinners. He's the one who delivers sinners out of the kingdom of Satan, and he makes them saints in Christ. The whole force of Satan's hatred is lashed out like a hurricane against the church and the Christians who are the Lord's faithful witnesses and wrestlers. And this, you see, is the warfare of Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. 
And then, too, in Ephesians we learn that as well as the head of the church, in a coming day, the Lord Jesus Christ will be the head over all things in the universe of God. Ephesians 1.10 says, and I quote, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Thus, you see, that the complete victory over Satan will be accomplished by God through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, just as we noticed the enemy last week as to his person, position, and power, realizing the importance of knowing the enemy if we are to experience victory over him, much more important it is to know the conqueror, our Lord Jesus Christ, and to realize his person, his position, his power, and thus be assured of our invincibility in him. It is quite striking that in the six short chapters of the book of Ephesians, the name of our conqueror is mentioned 66 times. Nothing could more clearly reveal that the one with whom Satan has to reckon is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Savior. God told us of this centuries before in Isaiah 9 and 6, that marvelous prophecy which I wish to quote. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth forever. Oh, what names he bears! And they all reveal him to be God's beloved son and servant and man's matchless Savior Redeemer. Now so much for the person of the Son of God. He was the child born in Bethlehem. And why was this, might we ask? Well, he was born the child that he might become man to die. He was the son given. And why was this? He was the Son given in order to reign over God's universe. God himself tells this story of the position of our Lord Jesus, the conqueror, in these matchless words in Philippians 2, 6 through 11, and I wish to quote them. Listen, if you will. Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. The end of the quotation. The Son of God, you see, my friend, came out of eternity into time. He came out of heaven to earth to be the Son of Man. He became the incarnate Son of God. He took the body that was prepared for Him. He lived a perfect life in that body. He voluntarily laid his life down to death in that body. Now Satan tried to destroy the body of Jesus. He tried to overthrow it through Herod, you remember. He tried to overcome it when he was tempted in the wilderness, you will recall. And then in the Garden of Gethsemane, he tried to overstrain it, all with the purpose that he might keep it from the death of the cross. But my friend, Christ was born to die on Calvary's cross, and no power of Satan could stop this redemptive death of the Savior. Then Satan, being thwarted 
to keep Christ from the cross, he tried through the voice of the priests and the people to persuade Christ to come down from the cross. But our blessed Lord was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He knew that only through that could he destroy the devil and his works. And he did die. He was crucified. He became the crucified Son of God. Now, the whole outcome of the age-long conflict and the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 hung upon the death of the crucified one. When that cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, came from his lips, it seemed as though Satan had been victorious. But no, very soon after, from his lips with a loud voice, the Savior cried, It is finished. Satan's destruction was accomplished by the atoning death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan's works were destroyed, and Satan's workers were included in Christ's conquest over all the foes of God and the forces of evil. But Satan, well knowing that the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 had been fulfilled, knew now that the dead Christ must be kept dead. So you see, the resurrection was opposed by him and all the forces of the evil one. The sepulcher was sealed, you recall. A watch was set over it, we read. But by the working of almighty power, Christ arose. And then forty days later, he ascended. He passed triumphantly through Satan's realm as the prince of the power of the air. He led captive him, that is Satan, who held men in captivity. And he took his seat at the Father's right hand in the heavens, far above all the spiritual hosts of wickedness arrayed against him. And he thus became the risen and ascended Son of God. As we begin the letter to the Ephesians, we are immediately brought into his presence where he is now seated. And our place as believers is in him there, whether we engage in warfare with the powers of Satan or whether we walk before men here on earth. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who now occupies the very highest possible position in the universe of God, and he is the one with whom men have to do. In governmental authority, God has exalted him to be the Lord of his universe. He's far above all angelic and celestial beings. He's been made head of the church, which is his body, and he is the object of the worship of all the redeemed ones. He gathers his own around him at his table here on earth to remember him in his death and to worship and adore him as the only worthy one to receive worship and praise. Tell me, my friend, do you worship Jesus? He also dispenses blessing through his ministers, gifted by him to proclaim his truth. It's the truth of God, which alone can set men free from Satan's bondage. It's the truth of God that will enrich with unsearchable riches of eternal value all who trust in Christ. And then as high priest and advocate, he presides over his true church's body to nourish and cherish it to protect and preserve it, and to make it victorious over Satan and his hosts. This, you recall, is what he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now then, Satan indeed is powerful, but praise be unto God, the Lord is all-powerful. All God's power is manifested in and through his Son, Satan does have authority over his realm of fallen angels and evil men, but the Lord has authority over Satan. All authority has been given to the Son of God, as he said in Matthew 28 and 18. Now then, where Satan's power is seen, as it is indeed today, it is only a permitted power. Remember, Romans 13 tells us this, and this is a great comfort. There is no power but of God. 
Also, Satan's power is only a limited power. From Job 1.12, we learn this, and I quote, The Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. And then again in Job 2 and verse 6, the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand. That is, Job was in his hand. But save his life. God set, you see, a boundary line beyond which Satan could not touch or harm Job. And just so the God who knows the exact proportions of the believer's strength and endurance will not allow Satan to afflict one whip beyond what we are able to endure. Isn't that comforting, fellow believer? It is. 1 Corinthians 10.13 tells us that truth. But then again, Satan's power is also a resisted power. The Lord said, Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Oh, how good to realize that when Satan exercises his power against the people of God as he does against Peter, he is met with a conquering spiritual force by the prayers and intercession of our great high priest, the Lord Jesus. And then again, Satan's power is a broken power. The Lord Jesus, the stronger than the strong one, as we read in Luke 11, 21, 22, has overcome Satan, broken his work, taken his armor, and divided the spoil. Since Calvary, Satan is a defeated foe. He has no claim on any child of God, and no power can touch the child of God beyond what God permits. Now, Satan was permitted to stone Stephen, but God, without a doubt, used Stephen's triumphant martyrdom as a factor in robbing Satan of one of his most successful tools up until then, Saul of Tarsus. And then, too, Satan's power, my friend, is a doomed power. The day is coming when Satan will be bound a thousand years and shut up in the bottomless pit that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years be fulfilled. Looking ahead then to that day of the doom of Satan's power, I would ask that you read Revelation 19 verses 10 through verse 3 of chapter 20. We learn there that the Lord Jesus Christ will come as King of kings and Lord of lords to earth with all his saints, and settle the issue in the warfare once for all. Satan, with all the cunning and wisdom of a master mind, will summon his human and hellish hordes from the ends of the earth for that decisive battle. The battle of Armageddon will be fought, as we read in Revelation 16, and the Lord will triumph over all. The Lord will then rule for a thousand years a righteous, peaceful reign here on the earth. And during this time, I repeat, Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit. But at the end of those thousand years, he'll be released. There will be no change in his diabolical nature, and he'll start out again in the role of the deceiver of nations, and God will allow him to do this. He will use him, in fact, to gather up all the rebels in that kingdom, those who had only yielded a make-believe allegiance to the king and thereby got by with their life. But then fire will come down from heaven upon all such at the end of the millennium. And then, in Revelation 20.10, in connection with the devil, we read this, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. There's a solemn passage in Revelation 20.15 too, my friend, and it tells us this, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. But, oh, each one who despises 
who rejects the grace of God and does not accept the Savior as his own deliverer and conqueror shall find himself cast into that lake of fire, for his name has not been written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name written there? But now you will have noticed that this warfare then between heaven and hell, between darkness and light, between Satan and the Lord will be ended at last. Every enemy of God will be subjected and cast out. The kingdom of the Son of Man will be delivered by the Son to the Father, that God may be all in all throughout eternity. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. My friend, whose kingdom are you in? Oh, I urge you to seriously consider the issues. Will you not rally right now to the side of the Lord Jesus Christ, the conqueror of Satan, of sin, and of death? Will you not repent of your sins to him and accept him as the one who died for you and rose again? Oh, receive him by faith without any further delay. Only thus will you be on the winning side of this warfare with its eternal consequences.